Hey everyone, Gripeway here, and I'm just going to be doing a quick video tutorial showing how to play at least the version of Gloomhaven that I'm playing on Tabletop Simulator, because I'd had some questions about that. So I'm just going to show everything you need to know in order to play the version that I have, how to get it, and how to set it up, which hopefully we should be able to take care of in not too much time. So, let's get to it. Uh, first things first, we need to get the version of uh, the Gloomhaven mod for Tabletop Simulator. So it's just this link here, which I'll include in the video description. We go to this link, we need to be logged into Steam. It's in the workshop, and then we just have to hit subscribe. We're already subscribed, so we don't need to do that. We just click that, and then wait until it downloads on our Tabletop Simulator. The file size is pretty small, so it doesn't take very long. Okay, and then after that, we're going to go into Steam, and we're going to start up Tabletop Simulator. And we'll show you how to set up the game from there. Okay, just got to switch my source now. Should work. No, there we go. Now it's working. All right. Thank you, OBS. All right, so now we're in Tabletop Simulator. We already have our mod downloaded, so what we're going to do is click on Create. Uh, I prefer to play it in Hot Seat. Um, I'll explain why in a second when we get into the game, but it's basically to make it so that I can have two separate hands, which I find to be convenient. So I'm going to do Hot Seat. Uh, you can set whichever number of players you want between two to four, depending on the number of characters you're going to play. I mean, I guess theoretically you could play five solo if you wanted, but this would be quite aggressive. Uh, I think normally I would recommend playing two. For me, already just playing two solo is is quite taxing, so I would never try to do more than that. But I know some people do like to play three solo. All right, so we're just going to set this to whichever number of characters we're going to play, which here is going to be two, and press start. Okay, now we need to choose our colors. This actually matters uh, quite a bit because there are, at least for this mod, there are four player slots, except there are like eight or nine, you know, nine different colors that you can choose from here, which corresponds to the different player slots of the player boards, which are going to be in this mod. Um, I don't know which ones correspond to all of them. It took some trial and error to actually figure this out, but I can use the two that are on the right side of the board, which are next to each other. Like I know if I use red and blue, for example, I'll use the right side, and I think red will be the second from the left, but blue and white will actually give me the two... Um, player boards which are on the far right side which allow me to keep them next to each other which is convenient enough for me some trial and error can allow you to figure out a different combination if you want or if you're going to play three players i mean in that case you could use red white and blue uh, which is also convenient given that uh, france just advanced to the finals of the world cup all right so anyway here we're going to choose blue for player one and then white for player two and then we're going to go in here so all these things this is where our save files will be but for now we're just going to get our gloomhaven second printing scripted which is in our workshop workshop line on tabletop simulator so we're just going to click that and we're just going to click load and it's going to take me a while because i'm playing a laptop but it will eventually load up here and then we'll get into some more things with that so we're just going to wait for it to load um yeah so i really like this mod i think it's really well made there's like one minor complaint that i basically had uh, which is a pretty small one which is just not making it easy not having a button to discard cards rather than like a button for lost cards which someone actually is already going to fix for me which is super swell but uh yeah other than that I, I really think this is is incredible i've been super happy using it all right so we're loaded in we can see that we have player one and player two next to each other so the first thing you'll notice you have this end turn thing so this allows us to switch from one player's perspective to the other player's perspective uh, this is really only going to matter for one thing, which is going to be the hands, and we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, just to give you, take stock of everything, so on the left we have where all our items are, only the items we start with are flipped over, otherwise they're all face down, random item designs are there. Uh, we have the rule book, which is here. Um, you'll need to familiarize yourself with, you can go through the tutorial actually to figure out what most of the hotkeys are, otherwise you can also press the backslash slash question mark, um, or no, it's a forward slash, sorry, forward slash slash question mark uh, key, which will actually bring up the list of hotkeys. Uh, it would take too much time for me to go over each individual one, but uh, you can see we can even do convenient stuff like flipping over the rule book using the flip key, which will allow us to look at the back, which is, you know, a convenient cheat sheet, stuff like that. All right. Uh, here we have our starting players. Here are the other ones. Uh, fortunately, uh, mousing over them does not give their names, but be careful if you do drag one of these out, it will give you the name of it afterwards. So be very careful with that. Um, and then, yeah, here are some envelopes up here, and uh, that's, yeah, sorry, I was just a little bit distracted by looking at something. Um, over here we have the scenario books, uh, the map, a bunch of other cards. You can see most of the stuff yourself, but I'm going to go over how we're actually going to get set up. So the first thing we need is our two players. So we're going to choose two characters to play. I guess this time I'll just grab out the Brute and the Tinker. So to create these characters, we're just going to click and hold on to, or no, sorry, we're just going to click and pull 
quickly one of these boxes out for one player and one of these boxes out for the other player. All right, and we're going to orient our players around where their um, player boards are, so player one and two. So first, you can see when I mouse over it, it lists a number of things inside that container. So I'm just going to grab all those things out, and then I can rearrange them afterwards. And then after I've grabbed all those things out, I'm just going to mouse over my uh, player box and press delete. And then we're going to do the same thing for the tinker, again, grabbing out all his things or her things. His, and it's actually supposed to be, although it really looks like this person's wearing a shower cap to me every time I glance at it. All right, and then delete that as well. So let's start setting up. So we've got the Brutes character mat. So we just drag that over and drop it down. It'll kind of align itself automatically. We'll do the same thing for the Tinker. Uh, then we've got the mod additional modifier cards. These we're just going to hold over on the side because we're not going to need those immediately. We've also got the uh, character sheet. We're also just going to keep that on the side for the time being. We have the figurines. I mean, this is what doubles for the figurines. We're going to put these up by where we're going to set up our map. We've got the little additional tokens. Uh, I just like to set these on my player mat here up near the top. Usually we place these most of the time on the active cards, which are up here. So having them next to that is pretty convenient for me. Uh, be careful. Yep, here I just made the mistake. Um, so this is actually important. If I just click quickly and drag, it actually grabs something out of something. I have to click and hold and wait until I've actually picked up the entire thing in order to, con to move an entire container. All right, and I'm just going to quickly mouse over those and press delete in order to get rid of them. All right, um, so now what we have to do is actually have to figure out uh, where we're going to kind of like set up everything. So our hands are actually going to basically, I mean, all right, if I take one of these cards and I mouse over this area, you'll see this is actually where the hands will end up kind of resting. So I want to make sure that I, I set the rest of my stuff below this, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take my brute sheet and I'm place it here. And then I'm just going to place my advanced cards here, my modifiers here and my basic cards here. And in the end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave my leveled up cards here. Actually, yeah, I can grab the first. So again, I'm just a quick, quick drag. Remember, if I click and hold, it's going to lift the entire thing. So I've just grabbed the top three cards off, which will be the X cards. So I'm going to use those plus my level one cards, which were separate here, in order to create my starting deck. Uh, we'll just do this quickly. I'm not actually going to show you which cards I would choose here, because I've done this anyway. So I just need to get 10 cards. And I'm going to use all three X cards here, because why not? And this will make my hand. And actually, I shouldn't be separating these. I should drag them down to my hand immediately, but I'll worry about that in a second. So now we have our 10 cards here. We have the three cards that we're not using, which is where I'm going to keep my extra cards. So once I level up, you know, I'll have more cards that I leave here, which are kind of like my cards on the side, which I can always like sideboard into, so to speak. Uh, the additional modifiers that I add here and my advanced cards here. Um, which will be what I get through leveling up. And so now in order to put these things in my hand, there are multiple different ways we can do this, but I've learned the most convenient way, thanks again to a very helpful viewer, um, is actually I can just mouse over these cards and I can press a number which is higher than these cards in order to put them directly into my hand. So now I need to make sure that I am actually the player who corresponds to that mat. So actually you can see player one is going to be the tinker and player two is going to be the um, brute. So actually you can see based on the color up here which player I am. Um, we can also see you know, based on the player here. But so right now I'm player 1, which is blue. So I'm going to switch over to player 2, which is going to be my brute. And then I put these into my hand. So to do this, all I have to do is mouse over these cards, this pile of cards here. And then I'm just going to quickly tap 9 twice, which is going to give me 99, which is going to put all these cards into my hand. Whatever number I tap uh, will be the number of cards put into my hand. 99, or I can even just do 11. So just a quick 1-1, one, one, and we'll put all these cards into my hand. For the other players in the game, these cards will all appear face down. It is only for you that these cards will appear face up. This is what will allow you to keep your hand separate. So if you see, if I press enter and I go over to player one, these cards are all face down now. So playing solo, this is less important, um, but for playing with other people, this will be really important, obviously, because you're not allowed to show each other your hands. So you'll see that the cards are here, but you'll see that by having them in my hand, as long as I'm this player, no matter where I go on the board, these cards will also remain in my hand here. I can rearrange them by clicking and dragging, and I can press Alt, which is what zooms in on something, to get a closer look at any one of these cards at any time. And then once I want to play these cards, I'm clicking, simply going to click and drag the cards, and so I'm player three, and put them into my two slots here. Uh, technically, I guess, if you're playing with other players, what you'd want to do is actually flip the card over in your hand first by pressing F and then click and drag it to the respective slot. The top card is going to be the card that determines the initiative and then eventually the bulk get flipped over. So here I'd probably want the 15 initiative. So let's just do this again, you know, the proper way. So again, we've got shield bash. I mean, we never probably play these two cards together. Balance measure, shield bash, not really a combo, but again, just um, to show you how it's done. So shield bash is going to be my initiative card. So I'm going to put it up here. And then balance measure for my amazing combo is going to go here. And these two cards will get revealed automatically, which we'll get to shortly. Okay, and now that's how we basically set up most of the Brute to play the game. Uh, after that, we're going to move over to setting up the Tinker real quick. So we're going to switch over to that player. We're going to do more or less the same thing. We're going to put his sheet. We've got to make sure that we grab it. We're going to put it down here. Modifiers, again, making sure to grab all of them here. Advanced cards here. We'll just leave the Xs on the side, and we'll just take the 12 cards into our hand. So now we have our hand for the Tinker. Uh, and I had already placed 
his figurine up there. All right, so what else do we need to start the game? We're going to need items, so why don't we go buy those real quick? Uh, we'll just you know, kind of do this quickly. So Tinker, why not? We're going to go grab a um, goggles. We just bring this over here on the item slot. What you can do for once you're actually playing is you can switch the rotation degrees by clicking up here to 90, and then Q and E. Other, you can use mouse wheel, but I prefer to just use Q and E. So E will actually allow us to just rotate this card just by mousing over it. Be careful not to pick it up, because if we pick it up, rotate, and set it back down, it's automatically going to um, fit back to the little item slot that's designed for it. So the easy way to do this when we use it is simply just to press E, which will put it like this, and then when we refresh it, we press Q, again, just by mousing over it. All right, so that's all his money, and we're just going to grab something quick for the brute. Uh, sure, a healing potion and some shoes. And so I'm just going to click and drag, which allows me to grab both of these. I'm going to click and hold them. I'll bring them both over here, and then I'll set them both individually into the item slots. Uh, so now I just need to grab, oh, I need to deselect both of them, grab one of them, put there, grab the other and put there. So again, we'll use Q and E to rotate this when it's used. And then we'll press F, which is the key for flipping, to flip this over when this is used or consumed. Okay, that gives us all of our items. Uh, Let's see, what else do we have to show? In terms of players, we can set the maximum health here, which just is a reminder for us. So to start, we're going to have 10 maximum health on the root, and the Tinker is going to have 8 maximum health. And then we can set what our actual health is, like this. So there we have 8, and here we have 10. From then on, we can, whenever we want, modify the health here, but we can also modify it up here, which is actually going to be more convenient because this is where we're going to be focused most of the time is up here. We're spending less time looking down here. So, for example, for the Brute, if, when we take damage, we can just press this damage button on him. And again, it doesn't matter which player you have selected when you're doing things like this. The player selection really only matters, assume, again, assuming you're playing solo. If you're playing uh, multiplayer, you're going to always have yourself selected. Um, it only really matters just for whose hand we're looking at, basically. Uh, so this is how we would do damage. This is how we put health back if they get healed. Pressing this will give us experience, um, which, again, we can see is tracked down here. We can modify it there, but again, this will just be easier. Okay, uh, we'll get to these other buttons in a second. All right, so what do we have next? Next we have, well, a few different things we could go over. Uh, for party setup, the sheet is just right here. We're just going to click and drag one of these out. I like to put it over down on the side here. And you can see whenever you mouse over any of these fields, there will be a little um, context icon that pops up on the cursor. So, for example, here I mouse over the Tinker's name. If I click, now I can type his name out and etc. Um, so this is how we modify the golden experience, just by clicking these buttons. Most of this should be pretty self-explanatory. And perks, it's just a little button thing that we click accordingly. Okay. All right, so let's set up the map. How do we need to do that? Well, first we need to see which scenario we're going to do. Obviously, the scenario is going to be scenario one. In order, any of these things, when you mouse over it and you see these blue circles that are all interconnected, this means that this has state-based um, changes. So when we do that, we can press key uh, buttons numbers on the keyboard. Wow, uh, I'm really quick this morning. Uh, numbers on the keyboard to switch different states, but to begin with, until you're familiar with it, you can just right click, mouse over state, and then mousing through each one of these will tell you which scenario. So for example, here, page three will take us to the book for scenario one. Down here is going to be a little bit inconvenient, so what we're going to do is we're going to click and drag this and put it up here. We can always move it back there afterwards if we want. Oh, we just set it on top of our player things. This will allow us to set it next to where we're going to set up the map. Next, what we need are map tiles. Uh, here we have the infinite supply of map tiles. So what we're going to do is we actually have to click and drag a box out of this infinite supply of boxes. Okay? Then this gives us our actual box for map tiles, which is what we can search through to find the map tiles we need. So what map tiles do we need? We need L1A, G1B, and I1B. Okay. So it is important to, to note that by flipping the map tiles over, you will not go to the other side. A and B are not flippable. Um, so you will actually have to search the A's and the B's. Uh, respectively. So let's just move this over next to this. Again, we do, do that by clicking and holding on it until we pick it up and then moving it. All right, so L1A, G1B, and I1B. So we're going to right-click on this, and we're going to use the search function. This is going to take a little bit to load the textures for all these, but we can still grab them while they're loading. So we need L1A. Oops, type B, L1A. So we're just going to click this, drag it, we'll drop it over here. The texture for that, like I said, will load eventually. For now, it's not such a big deal. Then we need G1B. We're just going to do that like this. And then finally, I won't be. And we'll do that like this. Okay, now we've got all our textures out there. We're done searching through that. We can click and hold this to just move it back down over onto the side where we're going to keep it. Okay, so now we need to set the map tiles together. Uh, so first of all, we need to rotate this. We can just use Q and E. Since we've got it set to 90 degrees, it will automatically make 90 degree rotations, which makes this much more convenient. This is actually the one that's going to go up in the top left. So this is going to be up there. 
This one's going to be at the bottom. We can see it goes like that. And then this one's going to connect the two, just like that. Uh, so this takes a little bit of work. You, they're supposed to snap together. They don't always work perfectly. You can actually adjust the state on them, which is done, you can see here, or the scale, sorry, by going up or down, which is the plus or minus keys. I generally avoid doing this. I find it a little bit finicky. Um, but otherwise, I mean, it's not such a big deal. We'll get it basically more or less as good as we can. It's not actually perfectly lined up, but it'll work just fine. I mean, I'm not super picky about this. Okay, so that's given us our map. So the first thing we need to do is to get our doors to connect the two rooms. So as we can see for this map, this is just going to use the regular doors. Okay, the regular doors, we're going to find them right down here and the stone door closed. We're just going to click and drag two of these out of here. So you'll see that again, these have different states. These are for the flat doors and then there are the diagonal doors. So we actually need one flat, one diagonal. So the flat door is going to go here Again, just rotate it. We'll just put it there. Uh, what's also is a pretty good idea is actually to lock all of these map tiles. Um, we do this just by, we can click and drag to select all of them. Other, otherwise, we can just do it individually for each one by mousing over it and pressing L. Now, once we've done this, we cannot move it anymore, which will be convenient for when we place things on top of it or removing things around so we don't accidentally click and drag it. So I'm just going to lock each of these, and I'm also going to lock my door. Uh, this is just so that when I place characters next to it or something like that, it's not going to mess it up. I'll always need to remember to unlock it once I want to remove it. Uh, there is, unfortunately, in this mod, no scripted function for opening doors, but it's not too difficult to just do that yourself. All right, so now we've got this other door, except, again, this is not the right type. We need to use the other type of door. I mean the other, the diagonal rather than the uh, flat one, and then we place that right there, and then we're going to lock it as well. You can see I haven't perfectly set up my map tiles. There's this actually overlapping a little bit, so the door's not perfect. You can, like I said, fiddle with this a little bit more if you want. Uh, I don't consider it to be such a priority. I'm just going to place my characters now just so that I get them onto the board. This would obviously not really be the optimal placement necessarily, but you can see with the map that we can place them in any of these seven. And obviously we would do this after doing road events and battle goals and everything like that. All right, so then we need monsters. So what do we have for monsters? We have bandit guards, bandit archers, and living bones. Why this is not in alphabetical order is beyond me, but we will do it regardless. All right, so here we have got Gloomhaven monsters and Gloomhaven bosses. So just like for the map tiles, we're going to need to grab one of these monster boxes just by clicking and dragging it out because this is our infinite supply of boxes. Again, we're going to right click on this and click search, and then we can find the things. Now the bandit guards and bandit archers are actually both in the very beginning, so we can just grab both of these out. And then we need living bones, which we can either scroll down or, as usual, there is a search function, which I type really well, so we can grab, grab out living bones as well. Now, this is just going to be like these. This is going to give us an infinite supply of what we need. So I'm first going to move my infinite supply over here, making sure that I click and hold to wait sure it's picked up until I move it over. Okay, then I can click and drag from here, and this will bring me basically an entire set of everything I need to use these monsters. So I'm going to get one of these for each, and then we're going to see everything that comes out of this. So now this is my banded archer supply, which contains eight different things that I need for the banded archer. First thing is going to be the card for the archer. Second thing is going to be the monster cards, or this, I guess the sheet, the monster cards, and then we've got the I mean, minis or sandies, whatever they be. After I've grabbed all those out, there's nothing left inside this container. I'm simply going to mouse over and delete it. And you would do this for all three of these, but I'm only going to show you how to do it for one. Uh, actually, I'll do it for two because that'll show the cover function a little bit better. All right, so we'll do the same thing for bandit guards. Grabbing the cards out and grabbing out all the guards. And mousing over this and delete. All right, so let's grab uh, our sheets that we've got here and place them onto the board here for these respective monsters. So we'll click and drag the bandit guard, put it first because we're going to stick with not alphabetical order, and then the bandit archer there. And then we need to get the respective monster cards. We're going to click and click and hold until we've got them all picked up, and then we're going to put them just underneath in the respective space like so. We also need to make sure that for every monster, we want them all to be eliminated by default is the safest way. If they're not eliminated, they're going to flip cards, even if they're not revealed. So we're going to start with making sure we have all of them eliminated. And then whichever ones we're going to place on the board, which for example, here we can see we're going to place uh, three guards. We'll make sure we uneliminate them so that they're actually going to do something in the script. And we'll worry about that in a second. Once you've placed their sheets here, we can cover all of them. We just place or click on this button, which will automatically cover all the things. If, for example, you needed to do a 10, which I guess I could have used the living bones, but I'll just use the archer as an example. A 10 sheet rather than a six sheet. Uh, you can always do this again just by right clicking and going to state. Although here it's easy enough since it's just one or two, I can just mouse over this and press two, which will switch to the 10 state rather than the six state. Okay. All right. So that gives us our monsters. We're also just going to shuffle these. Shuffling is done by pressing R or right clicking and clicking uh, shuffle. R is a pretty easy hotkey to remember. So I'm going to mouse over this and press R, mouse over this and press R as well, which shuffles up both of these. 
All right, uh, so that gives us our monsters set up. Let's set their standees on the board. So like I said, in the first room, we've got just for two players, two regular bandit guards and an elite bandit guard. So I'm just going to grab my three bandit guards and bring them over here. So this is going to be done switching from elite to regular, just like any other state-based thing, right-clicking and going to state. Although again, this is easy enough since only one out of two. Mousing over and press two will give us our elite. So we're going to place our elite there. Again, I'm not really perfect to play. Oh gosh, yeah. Not really perfect at placing these things. I'm just going to rotate that. Again, it's up to your own discretion how meticulous you want to be with setting up your monster standees on the board, but this will do for me for now. And that gives us our first room setup. We also do want to do just, or at least I prefer to do, like I normally do when I play the game for real. So I want to get all the other pieces I'm going to need. So I'm going to need one treasure, two damage traps, and two tables. So let's do that. We're going to come over here. You can see that the obstacles are all in the greens so we're, and in alphabetical order. So tables just going to be here. And again, I'm just going to drag two of these out and keep them over by the board. One treasure and then two spike traps. And now I have all the additional things I need to set up on the board just nearby for when I need them. Um, in terms of placing money when things die, this is pretty obvious. We just click and drag coins and place them onto the board. Um, and I think that covers that. All right, what other things? I mean, summons are down here. That's not super relevant. Again, we can find our road and city events. We would shuffle these first, then just draw one. Here's the additional curse and attack modifiers that we need to add. Um, I think that covers most of the things there. Let's, I mean, I'll, I want to go through and show you how a turn is actually done. Um, but so first, what I'm going to need to do is actually play some cards for the Tinker. Uh, also, uh, yeah, this is another really important thing to mention. Since we mentioned eliminating monsters, we also need to make sure that we have always eliminated all the players which aren't going to play. So here it's only player three and player four. I mean, in terms of where their boards are. So it's actually, we're called player one and player two, but they're in the player three and player four slots. So we're going to eliminate the player one and player two slots so that the, the script can actually work. All right. So we've already placed our brute cards. So we need to place our Tinker cards. So I'm just going to use two cards real quick. Again, flip ink bomb, put this from initiative. And again, like I said, if, if I'm playing solo, I usually place these cards first and then flip them face down. Uh, you do want them to be face down so that the script will actually work. Um, but if I'm playing solo, I'm going to, like I said, I mean, if I'm going to play multiplayer, I'm going to flip them in my hands. And I guess there's no harm necessarily in flipping, just getting the habit of flipping in your hands all the time anyway. All right. Uh, that should be good. Well, actually, let's, well... We can try a different type of... No, actually, that, that'll work. That'll work. That'll be perfect. All right. So now we've placed everything for the turn. We have our monster set up. We have the only monster, which is actually on the board, not eliminated. And so all we have to do is press the reveal button. And this is going to be really convenient. It's going to flip over all our cards, flip over a monster, and show us our initiative order here. Um, let me just let me just go back. and Well, no, I'll do it after ending this turn. I can show you what would have happened if we accidentally had forgotten to make sure that, for example, him was eliminated. It's going to mess things up a little bit. But all right. So now we can see our initiative order. So this is super easy. We're just going to go through and play in the initiative order that we see here. So the first we see is player two, which we know is the brute. Um, so again, it doesn't matter whose turn you have it on right here. I can go to player two to play his turn. The only reason I might care about this is if I cared about seeing what cards were in his hand while I'm making a decision to what to do with his cards. All right. So then we just go through and enact the actions our player is going to do. So here, let's say we're just going to use uh, Shield Bash as a default move two. So I'll do that first. I do my default move two, moving up to the Elite Guard. And well, I guess just for just to make it a little more thorough, actually what we're going to do is we're going to use our default move two plus boost of striding. So we're going to activate that to get two more movement, and then we're going to go tuck, tuck, like that. We'll make a move four instead, just to make balance measure a little better. Obviously, if we were playing for real, we would have done a move four on bottom here to make this an attack six and actually just kill one of these guards immediately. But uh, let's just show. All right. So this is, like I said, my one complaint is what I wouldn't mind, um, and I know someone's going to have actually fixed this for me, so uh, maybe the mod designer will consider doing this in the future as well, is a button just to discard this card immediately. So now, like, what I can do, because normally when we play for real, what we do is immediately we've act after we played an action of a card, we put that card into our discard assuming that it doesn't, it's not an active card or lost card. Here, uh, when you press end round, it's going to automatically discard all the cards that are left in play here, but it can leave a little more confusing of space. Plus, you know, with stamina potions and stuff like that, it can be a little bit messy. If we play lost cards, there's a button to make the card immediately lost. It's just not a button to immediately make the card discarded. We'll leave the card here for now to show how the script works afterwards. All right, so we get to play balance measure for an attack four. I always like to do my experience first so that I don't forget. So I'm going to gain my one experience just by pressing that button. Uh, again, it doesn't matter which player I've selected because the experience is for that respective player. I mean, it doesn't matter which player's turn it is. So this is going to allow me to do an attack four. So to do an attack four, we've got our basic modifier deck here. And obviously, once you start adding modifiers or removing modifiers, you'll take them out and put them into here, just like you normally would using these extra modifiers we have down here, um, the class modifiers, that is. 
All right, so to draw a modifier for our attack, which is by default an attack four, we just press this button here. Sometimes you'll notice uh, if you mouse over it right away, yeah, it doesn't highlight. You got to wait until you actually see that little red button, which indicates that the script for it will actually work. So we're going to press this, and it flips over plus zero. It also tells us exactly here and here what happens. So we got a plus zero. So that's going to be four damage. So how you want to track the monster health is really up to you. There are a lot of different ways. The way that someone suggested in my chat, which I'm actually taking the habit of doing, is actually just right-clicking on all the standees and giving them a health in their description. So for example, these guys normally have six health, so I would have gone six health for you, and then it's nine health for the elite, and then six health for this one. This is pretty convenient because just looking at the board, I can mouse over for a second and see what its actual health is. But there are downsides to this as well, which is that it takes a little bit of time, and uh, it's, I guess, takes a little bit more time to modify, although I'm not actually sure it actually does. So anyway, this would be two da four damage, so then he would go down to two. The other way we can do this is we have all the health trackers here, so we can do this the default way in Gloomhaven just by grabbing some from here. So this was number four. So we would just take one, two, three, four. This can be a little bit difficult to see sometimes, which is the downside of this. Otherwise, the other option we have, and so if I want to get rid of these, I can just mouse over them and press delete, being careful not to delete the things behind. If you're afraid of deleting this, you can always just lock it so that now, even if I press the delete button while mousing over, because it's locked, I cannot delete it. Uh, otherwise, we've also got the option to do two different types of health trackers here. One is with dice, which is what I was using originally, which I think is not bad. So I can just set the die on him. So this was again, number four. Uh, so we'll set up four, six, and three, all of them just to show. Four, six, and three, four was the one we hit. So four, six is the elite. So six, so let's have nine health. So we can just mouse over this and press nine, which will set it to nine. Uh, and then these other ones, we're supposed to have six health. So we'll just mouse over both of them. Oh, I got a mouse for a second. Uh, no, I guess I press the number and then click on it. Yeah, that's how we do it. So I, this was always a little bit uh, fiddly for me, which is one of the reasons why I stopped using the dice. So yeah, by pressing the number and then clicking on the die, it will change the number to that amount. I think there's maybe a way to do it a little more fluently. Uh, so then number four, he's taking four damage. So he's going to go from six down to two. So I'm going to press two and then I'm going to click on this and that'll put that down to two life on him. So that's these are all the different ways you can track it. There's also, you can grab out these little trackers, although I actually find this the most, most annoying. Um, although I guess maybe you could do something like I don't know, setting these on top of them and see their health that way. I guess that's another possibility. Anyway, you can really experiment with which whichever method of tracking health of monsters works best for you. Okay, so Brute's turn is done. So I'm going to press this little button here, which shows that his turn is gone. So now I see that it's the guard's turn. They're going to do this action here. After they've completed their action, I'm going to click on this. Then the... Um, uh, the Tinker is going to do his action. All right, so we've got two different types of things I can show here. So one is Lost. If we play a Lost card, for example, let's say that we were to play Ink Bomb, I would just press this Lost button after playing it, which will put it immediately into the Lost pile. Otherwise, for active cards, uh, we're just going to press this button here, which puts them into the active space. So for example, if we created the Summon. Uh, one thing that is worth mentioning uh, for this, though, is that active cards, so for example, let's say that we'd use the bottom of Shield Bash. If we press the active button, it is going to go here. Now, this is a one-turn active, not a persistent active. And you'll see that, unfortunately, when we press End Round, this will not get automatically discarded. We will have to manually remove this or press the discard card up here at the end of the round or lost card again if the card is going to end up being lost uh, after the, the one turn persistent. Uh, elements are pretty easy. You can simply press add to add them and then you can press consume to consume them. And you'll see that these will also go down automatically. For when the monsters attack, their modifier deck is right here. Again, you just mouse over this, wait until you see the little red button, and then you can press to draw modifiers for the monsters. Um, that's going to take care of almost everything. Additionally, you'll see that this little thing is lit up green here. This means means that this is because there's a shuffle here. So this will automatically reshuffle all the monster cards that are the monster decks that needed to be reshuffled. So we don't need to worry about manually doing that. The only time we really have to mess around with this manually is when we reveal rooms, uh, in which case we'll all manually grab one card off by going through doors. But you can kind of figure out how to do that yourselves, I think. All right, so then his turn is on. I do need to make sure that I've clicked through all these so that it, it won't warn me that there's a player who hasn't finished his turn yet. All right, so the round is over. So now all I have to do is press end round, and you'll see it automates everything. All the cards which are here get discarded. Uh, my one card, which is active, I'd already manually discarded. The round token goes up. This is just in case you're playing a scenario where this matters. And then the elements will all move down uh, one tier. And then you'll see his deck was reshuffled. Now I'll show you what would happen. So for here, for example, we have only bandit guards revealed. But let's say, all right, we're going to put um, some cards here and some cards here. Just grabbing, again, cards. 
Okay, uh, so here we have not eliminated the banded archers. So you'll see if I do press the reveal button now, it is actually going to flip for the banded archers as well, which is why it's so important to make sure that I do keep them eliminated so it doesn't flip for people who aren't here anymore. And once I've killed off all the guards, I'm going to press the eliminated button um, because otherwise the game won't know that it shouldn't keep flipping for guards until I reveal guards again, in which case I can uneliminate them and it'll resume flipping for them when we plus press reveal for the round. All right, uh, I think that covers almost everything. I'll quickly try to think if there's anything I missed. Um, so then we basically just go through the entire scenario like that. Uh, again, if you want to page through the rule book or anything like that, you can just right-click and go to State, which will give you the different pages. There's no really index things for this, although you can go to the beginning index, uh, which should tell you which page to go to. I think, I guess that's on page three, maybe. Uh, regardless, yeah. And then there's the little flow chart for uh, general rules and, and uh, monster targeting and all that, just in case you needed that here as well. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you can see that, oh yeah, for the treasures, it'll actually just be in the very last pages of here. So the, this is this, oh no, that's Soul Scenario, sorry. This is the Scenario Book 3. So the state, and then you can mouse over and you'll see a Treasure Index, Treasure Index, Treasure Index. Uh, I guess I should show you how to do that, but I won't show it on there. What I'll actually show is how to do it here. So once we do need to like legacy, things. All right, actually, this is a good example. Let's say we finished scenario one. So first we need to get our map sticker for scenario two. So we're going to do this by right-click on here, going to search. Uh, so now I actually can do, you can search by numbers. So for example, I can type 95, it'll give me scenario 95. Uh, the annoying thing is that there's actually no way to search for like one through nine uh, conveniently because they're just written as seven. So for example, pressing seven will give me everything with seven in the number. So for these, I kind of do need to know the number or the names. Uh, so the name for the second scenario is, hmm, I actually should know that by now. Black Barrow was the first. So I'm actually just going to press two and I guess we'll see. I'm sure someone does remember the name of it in the comments, but it's not a name that I've paid that much attention to. So I'm just going to have to find it. And obviously I'm probably looking all around and not actually finding it effectively. Or I've gone over it multiple times. Ah, barrel layer, that's it. All right, so I'm going to just grab the sticker out, and then I'll show you how to place it afterwards. Uh, so just grab that out, and close this. So we would have had to search for the by the name here, since, the, like I said, the 2 is kind of useless. This is only bad just for numbers 1 through 9. All right, so then we find where this is on the board, which is 2. And then we place it there, and it'll automatically stick itself basically as it should be. And then we need to mark black barrel one as complete. So in order to do that, we're gonna press the decal button over here. Uh, we're gonna use the small check mark rather than the large check mark because this is a pretty small space. And then we're just gonna mouse in or scroll mouse wheel in very close in order to make sure this lines up well. And boom, that gives us a check mark on there. We can do the same sort of thing for putting check marks uh, on the treasure chest that we've already unlocked in the book. I just don't necessarily want to go to that page because it might you know, spoil treasure chest for someone or something like that. Uh, and then I'm guessing for prosperity. Uh, yeah, so let's go back to the grab button. Uh, uh, I believe that the prosperity, oh yeah, no, the prosperity is actually done by grabbing out these little X's and setting them on the board because we actually don't want to decal this since it is possible to lose prosperity, in which case we can put these back. Uh, so that's how we unlock new scenarios. Achievement stickers are all up here. You can put those here. Uh, otherwise you write party achievements in the party sheet there. Mm, yeah, I think I've covered just about everything. Uh, the personal quest deck is here. I mean, you can just mouse over these different things and see where all the different things are. The bosses are done the exact same way. We grab our box of bosses, and then we do the search function into that to find the appropriate boss we need. So for the second scenario, this would be the bandit commander, who we're going to grab out. And again, this will give us an infinite supply thing. So we're going to put this over here, and we can grab out a single instance of this to get all the things we need. Oops. For playing against the bandit commander for scenario number two. Uh, after we're done with this scenario, we're going to press L to re un or to unlock all these parts of the board. It can be a little bit annoying sometimes with the, the doors, which I guess is one argument for not locking the doors. It's really up to you. So now we have two choices for what we can do for clearing this up. Uh, one is we can just mouse over select all these things, and then press delete. The downside of this is that this box we've taken of map tiles over here um, is actually going to not contain new copies of those. So otherwise, we could have clicked and dragged those map tiles into the map tiles here. This also doesn't matter so much, though, because we can always just delete this map tiles box and then just get a new map tiles box out every time. So it's really up to you however you want to do it, whether you want to delete or put them back in the box uh, like a good Samaritan. Um, there's some 3D objects here. I haven't really messed around with any of those. 
And yeah, I think that should more or less cover pretty much everything. Uh, maybe there's something I've forgotten to cover, in which case, uh, please let me know in the comments and I can try to answer that. But I think that should more or less let you know how to actually play this using this tabletop simulator mod, which again, I think is really great. And it's actually, I after playing yesterday, I almost really wanted to just play today. I was thinking, will I just play off the stream? Because I was having really, I mean, a lot of fun just playing Gloomhaven again, obviously. And I think this is a really great way to play Gloomhaven uh, when you can't necessarily always play it in, in person or with your friends directly. I mean, not just playing the solo, but, you know, for example, someone we used to play with back when we lived in the U.S. still lives in the U.S. We've been playing with them over Skype sometimes, but this is maybe a more convenient way to do this. So I, I think it is a really great tool to do this. I don't think this should be a substitute for owning Gloomhaven. I definitely recommend owning Gloomhaven to anyone who's considering it. I think it's such a great game and absolutely worth the investment. Obviously, I'm a bit biased, but still, uh, I just think this is a good supplement to allow you to play more Gloomhaven if you want to. So hopefully that should have answered anything. And like I said, any other questions, just let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. And have a great day.